Good morning, River Church. So glad to see so many of your sweet, sweet faces this morning. Amen. Amen. We have a couple of announcements. First of all, next Sunday, we're going to be doing a drive-by communion service. Drive-by communion service. You're going to drive by. I'm going to throw stuff in your window. It's going to be great. Uh, what we're really going to do is I wanted to show everybody at home that uh, for those folks who are who want to just make sure things are safe, this is a box that has been not even been opened yet of communion cups that are already, they're sealed and sanitized and everything. The, uh, the group, grape juice, I'm sorry, I'm having struggling with words here. Uh, the grape juice is sealed inside and so is the wafer. Everything is contained in itself. It's not even opened yet. And the day of, I will crack this bad boy open. I'll be wearing gloves, a mask, and everything else. And then um, if you'd like to come for communion service, we are, what we're going to do is literally, people are, I'm going to have people drive by at the front. Now, for those of you who are here on a Sunday morning, what we're going to do is we're actually going to, or going to be here for that service. We will actually put the cups out, and we're not going to pass them. You guys are going to come along and just grab one. No one's touching anybody else's stuff as sanitary as we can make it, but then for those who don't come to service after service at 1 p.m. after lunch, we'll be doing that. You drive up underneath the, the awning there, we'll hand it to you, pray with you, and let you go. You can park in the parking lot and take your communion with whoever is in your vehicle, and that's how we're going to do communion service. Amen? I don't know how else to do it, and I finally, I just got to the point where I'm like, man, we got to have communion service. I'm so tired of waiting and we can't let fear completely engulf our lives. And if uh, this is an opportunity for us to, at the very least, you know, commune together um, in our own vehicles, so be it. That's great. Also, too, um, I want to kind of pick your brains. Uh, for those of you who are already here, you're fine. You're obviously here. But for those of you guys at home, um, I'm interested in if you would be interested in having a earlier service, which would be a mandatory mask, uh, wipe down, there'd be no coffee, there'd be no, no snacks, there'd be nothing like that. I would have the first couple of, of chairs blocked off, so I don't have to wear, I'm hope, hoping to not have to wear a mask because I, try, I practiced wearing a mask and preaching for a, for a half hour, just reading through my sermon, and I felt like I was gonna hyperventilate after about 15 minutes of talking and wearing the mask, but I'll do whatever needs to be done. Home would be interested in a service like that. It would be bare, very spartan, very bare bones. It would be as safe as we can physically make it. Um, if you are interested in that, I am happy to put that together. It would probably be 8.30, 8 o'clock, 9, I don't know, but it would be very early, but at the, at the least, it would be something that would allow people to come in. Everybody would be a mandatory mask, mandatory everything. Um, anyway, just let me know. Email us at the church. Let us know if that's something you'd be interested in. And if we get enough folks who are interested, um, we will absolutely announce a start date for that and see how it goes. Amen. I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to be here. And I know that like Walmart and other places have opened up earlier and have limited the ages for those times. Um, I don't want to limit ages. I don't want to segregate our church family based on age, but I am more than happy to have a separate service that would be very, very safe for those who are susceptible. So that's what we're just interested. If you have any questions, feel free to email us. I sent it out with our normal email, but please email if you have any questions. Other than that, let's start the service. Amen. So if you guys open up your Bibles, we're in Ecclesiastes 10. So we're almost done with Ecclesiastes. Oh, that's sad, the sad noise. Oh, thank you. It's the sad noise. I love the sad noise when I say I'm almost done with something. We're almost done with Ecclesiastes, and we're starting to see the whole picture come together. I just love how just the Holy Spirit brings the whole picture together. We've now learned that God had a plan in mind the whole time. Mason, where's my coffee? Oh, okay. The, uh, and one of the things that we saw was we learned that God had a plan in mind when he created the world and you and I and life on this planet. And for lack of a better term, we have called this God's blueprint. Thank you. Oh, that's great. 
Um, and we have called this God's blueprint, and we see the first moments of creation. We see this blueprint come to life. So if you guys follow me here, we're just going to go jump to Genesis 1-3. You don't have to go there in your Bibles. It's up front, or it's down here if you're at home. We see this. Now read, listen to these words, read these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the, the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. But then interestingly, it says, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. In this first account of creation, we read that God took nothing, created this world in the universe, brought it into existence, but there's a gap in this text. This is the first verses in Scripture. But oftentimes, as the average person reads the Bible, we, we overlook that there's a gap here. We don't see what happened before God spoke stuff into existence. But here's the thing. We know without a doubt that God had a plan in mind because he didn't simply haphazardly create everything. So there obviously was some sort of a blueprint. There had to be, because God is a God of order, not chaos. For this reason, some theologians have pondered what God did before he spoke everything into existence. What he did in his silence is the question. And it's believed that, God before, that before God spoke, he formulated a plan, for lack of a better term, a blueprint for the world. And because we are made in God's image, we too need to take seriously our silent moments. Because God was silent before he spoke everything into existence. So we see this in the text of uh, the ancient uh, bishop of Antioch, uh, Ignatius. We've been studying Ignatius. We're reading through some of his letters. Very excited because this Wednesday, we're going through the disciples of the disciples, the letters of the people who were taught by the disciples. And Ignatius was a disciple of the apostle John. And we have his letters that he wrote all the way to Rome before he was murdered. And uh, I'm very excited because Father Ignatius, who's named after Ignatius of Antioch, who is the Orthodox priest downtown, who's a friend of mine, he is going to come on Wednesday and help co-lead that book study of Ignatius's letter. So I'm excited about that Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. If you can't be there at 10, feel free to, check, to catch it later. But Ignatius talks a lot about the silence of God. Interestingly, he believed that in God's silent moments, is that that's when we can most clearly experience his heart and intentions by focusing on what he does in those moments. He believed that in God's actions and his miracles, when he's not speaking so much as acting, we can truly understand who God is. And in the same way, we can, he says, hear, we can hear God's silence. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around. But similarly, just as God's heart is revealed in his silence, our desires and our true selves are revealed in our private time, in our silent moments when we are alone. The difference is that God is truth and we are not. We make mistakes and we can deceive ourselves into believing lies. We can actually lie to ourselves as we learned last week. And the teacher gives us a glimpse into this concept by contrasting the wise person and the fool. So the first point here today is number one in Ecclesiastes 10. The fool, fools create problems. You can add in there, create problems for themselves and others. The text reads, the struggles of fools weary them, for they don't know how to go to the city. Woe to you land, when your king is a youth and your princes feast in the morning. When you believe a lie, you inevitably create your own struggles, and because fools are people who believe lies, this comes naturally to them. They can't help but make mistakes. The teacher says that fools are so confused about how the real world works that they can't even manage to follow the road to their own hometown. The point is, is that this is kind of like an idiom. It's, it's kind of like we, we would say he's not even smart enough to come in out of the rain. That's what this is trying to say here. And then it says, Woe to the land when your king is a youth and the prince's feast in the morning. The point is, is that they are immature. They don't know when to do the right things. They feast in the morning because feasting is actually for dinner time. It's not for breakfast. And that would have been a thing that they would have had back in the time of the Hebrews. But the point is, is that he's confused. He doesn't have common sense. So Proverbs continues. It says, The way of the fool is right in his own eyes. 
but the wise man listens to advice. Fools lie to themselves and actually believe it. Part of the lesson is what, is, as we talk more and more about this, the more we convince ourselves, when we lie to ourselves, the more we tell ourselves lies, we convince ourselves that we are, what we're saying is true. In psychology, they have a word for this. It's called the illusory truth effect. If you're taking notes, feel free to write that down because this is a real measurable thing. The illusory truth effect. In a nutshell, it means that when you repeat a statement to yourself over and over again, or you're exposed to a statement over and over again, it becomes easier to process. It becomes easier to accept this idea, to believe it. And it actually be, starts to feel more truthful and real the more you're exposed to it, even if it's a lie, like flat earth or something. Whether you know the name or not, we all have experienced this effect. It's especially apparent during the election years. Right now, we're going through the elections. You go online, and then they, people say the same thing, and they purposefully do that. It's called propaganda. They purposefully drive home one point, one point, one point, one point. And even if it's not true, as long as you've heard it enough times, you start to believe it. So we see this with Nazi propaganda. World War II, the posters everywhere, the propaganda machine was so strong. Anywhere you went, the movies, or the, you walk on the street, or you go to church, anywhere you went, you would see pictures of Jewish people being evil and looking creepy and being scary. And then it, after a while, though, you start to believe it. You start to convince yourself it's true. Because here's the thing. If everybody's talking about it, there has to be some truth to it. And that's how that effect works. This is important if you want to not just protect yourself from lies, because this also is, an, is, essential, is essential to knowing the difference between a fool and a wise person. Wise people, the, ma the major difference is that wise people know they are unaware of the facts. Wise people know there's more to the story. Wise people know that they are limited in their understanding. In other words, wise people know they don't know. That's the core of wisdom. It's the core of humility. It's a knowledge and application of actually your limits, knowing what your limits are. Interestingly, a theologian by the name of Dr. Harding, he says this, such a humble spirit, this humble spirit that comes with wisdom, he says, is itself, it shows itself in several ways. First of all, recognition of one's, sinful, is one's sinfulness. That is because sin means we make mistakes. So you have to recognize the fact that you make mistakes. But then we are obedient to God and submissive to God. Why? Because we know we make mistakes. We know that we are flawed. We make mistakes. We are limited. So just naturally, because we believe that God is ultimate, we submit to God because he is truth. He is love. He is grace. He is the embodiment of all the things we're not. So it just makes logical sense that we would submit to his will because he knows best. And humble people recognize and embrace that fact, the fact that they don't know. They also know that others are also limited and don't know. And for this reason, wise people are not easily swayed by the illusory truth effect. Because they know that just because somebody says something over and over again doesn't make it so. Humility is also the added bonus of knowing that we, sometimes work, we have to sometimes work hard to discover the truth. Working with the police department and, do, and doing what I do with the chaplain program, it's very obvious that as they're breaking down a case and they're looking at the evidence, the truth is not as easy as you might think. Because we are sinners, we make mistakes, therefore we could be, and here's the reality of it, we very well likely are wrong. And this is what a wise person understands. So for this reason, wise people are cautious to accept statements without evidence. They are quick to listen rather than speak. They admit when they're wrong and when they make mistakes. That's what a wise person does. If you are wise, you admit when you're wrong. They also know that they were created with limits. And this is interesting because it teaches us that our potential, our possibilities, everything that we can do in life, and all of our limits are contained in the same life that we're living. That's the paradox of life. It's, just, it's a weird thing. It's a matter of perspective, though. 
The fact is that we have so many possibilities that for some folks it is crippling. I, was, I met with a young man from the university last year, and he didn't know what he wanted to do with his life. And he was crying because he, was, he had so many possibilities. He's like 20. He has the whole entire world ahead of him. He was good at all kinds of stuff. Great grades. He was just at that point where I don't know what I should major in. And it was crippling him. He was struggling to just be content with life. He was crippled from his potential because he had so many options. Do I go to trade school? Do I go to college? What career is right for me? But then there's also, on the opposite side of the spectrum, there's also our limits. We we have so many limits as well. I can't fly. I don't have wings. I can't see the future. I'm stuck in the now. But our life is, in our life is contained all of our potential and our limits at the exact same time. It's confusing. It's within these limits and possibilities that we see the wise person and the fool part ways. The fool denies the truth and creates problems for himself and others because they deny the truth. The fool does not recognize their limits. Therefore, they cannot see the truth in front of them. The fool causes himself problems because he can't see his limits or his potential for what they really are. But wise people are different, number two. Wise people create opportunities. Whoever's phone is doing that, can you silence your phone? Wise people create opportunities. Blessed are you, land, when your king is a son of nobles and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Wise people do things at the right time. They don't eat and drink to get drunk. They eat and drink to strengthen their bodies. Wise people are a blessing to themselves and others. This is most apparent when a leader is wise. When given authority, a wise person is able to transfer their wisdom to those they serve. They are able to bless others. The wise person does things at the right time, the kairos time. They search out the truth. They practice self-control in the pursuit of the greater good. And just as God, now this is where our, be, us being made in the image of God, understanding God and understanding who you are in God is so important. Because just as God created out of nothing, wise people also have the ability to create opportunities out of the chaos of life. It's a matter of perspective. Pastor Fosdick, I've, I've mentioned him many times and I've quoted him in services and I haven't really talked about him much, but he's great. And ironically, he was an American Baptist pastor who was arguing for social justice and racial equality in the 20s and 30s. He saw the height of his ministry before Martin Luther King was even born. And he was considered to be a hyper-liberal by his fellow pastors because he believed that everybody's equal. And his, his... movement that he caused, this, this movement that he was a part of, was so influential that he landed himself on the cover of Time magazine. He wrote about wisdom and godliness and, and love and grace and mercy, and I just love his sermons, and I've, I've read through just tons of his sermons. But he was talking about wisdom at one point, and he says this, he says, happiness, he's talking about wisdom and then how wisdom brings happiness. Says, happiness is not something that you find, it's something that you create. Not looking for ready-made happiness, but looking for opportunity. He also made the connection between being made in the image of God and us being able to create this kind of life. He says, because we're made in the image of God, you never find life, you create it. And how do you create opportunities? And I love this, this is exactly what we're talking about. He says, what existence hands us in raw material, what we have at our disposal, your bodies, your life, your circumstances, your job, whatever you have at your disposal, the raw material of life, is you have to make something spiritual out of that. And we as Christians know that God created this world for good. And that there is good in this world. It may be hidden below a whole big deep pile of sin, but it's there. God said it's good. We just need to search it out. But the wise do not just pursue God's goodness. They also invest in God's goodness, in God's grace, in God's blessings, in God's gifts. So that leads to point number three. Wise people invest in their blessings and their gifts. 
if you are a gifted at, you have the gift of administration or the gift of teaching or whatever gift you have, you should be encouraging that gift, trying to reinforce that gift, hone that gift. You have the gift of music, you should be practicing musical instruments. You should be trying to sing. You should be trying to practice. You should be writing music. You need to be investing in those gifts. But it doesn't end with just your spiritual gifts. It's also your blessings. So we see here in Ecclesiastes 10, because of laziness, the roof caves in. Because of ne the negligent hands, the house leaks. Again, this is a contrast between a wise person and the fool. The fool does not uh, invest in their blessings, like their home. This is essential to wisdom because we live in a fallen world. And, that's the, and we are subject to the laws of entropy, for example. We see evil people prosper in this life, but here's the thing. This is important for us to understand. Evil cannot sustain itself. Evil always rides on the back of goodness. Think about that. The average atheist will come out and say, God doesn't exist. Religion is nonsense. Ironically, they say that with the breath that God gave them. Without God's goodness and blessing, evil couldn't exist. Evil is a parasite that feeds on what God already created. The wise do the opposite. They know their limits and the limits of this world around them. For this reason, they invest in their blessings. So I noticed this a, a few, this is years ago, my wife and I had gone to our second or third marriage conference. And it was after a few conversations, I realized very quickly that the people who needed to be at the marriage conference weren't at the marriage conference. I was at church and our pastor's like, hey, there's a marriage conference coming into town. It's great. We're all, you know, we're going to get a group of people to go. Yay. It's a hotel. We'll stay overnight. It's going to be great. And my wife and I are sitting there, and I'm looking around going, where are John and Mary? Their marriage is falling apart. They need this more than anybody. But what it ca I came to realize was that as I looked around, the people in our church who had great marriages were at the marriage conference, and the reason why they had great marriages is because they were investing in their marriage. The reason why good mar people who have good marriages have good marriages is because they invest in them. They invest in the blessings that God has given them. And this is why the lazy person's roof caves in and why their house leaks. They do not invest in their blessings. On the contrary, the wise person appreciates their blessings. Wise people savor the moments they have. They value the gifts God has given them. And because of this attitude of gratitude, they look for opportunities to maintain and improve their blessings. We see this later in chapter 11. We'll get to it uh, shortly in our series. <clears throat> but we see this all over Proverbs. Go to the ant, you slacker. Observe its ways. Become wise. Without leader or administrator or ruler, it prepares provisions in the summer. It gathers food in the, during the harvest. How long will you stay in your bed? How long are you going to stay in your bed? You lazy fool, you slacker. The point is that even the ant, without the benefit of wisdom, gathers its blessings and prepares for the coming winter. Even the ant acts as though it has wisdom. Proverbs 27, it says, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herd. Why do you need to know the state of your flocks? Because the state of your flocks is directly correlated with the health of your family. If you want to feed your family, you need to invest in your flock. What is your flock? It's a blessing from God. You need to know the state of your flocks and invest in them because they are a blessing and they bless you. Prepare your work outside and make it ready for yourself in the field. Afterwards, build your house. You need to take the blessings you have, invest in those blessings. Then once those blessings flourish, then you build your house and get another blessing. Praise God. Interesting. The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but the fools gulp theirs down. Invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight. You do not know what disaster may come upon the land. Again, investing. We get this constant reminder to invest in blessings, but recognize your limits. You don't know the future. In invest in the many blessings that God has given you. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. 
Invest in your marriage now. You could die in a week. Invest in your children now. You might not be with them forever. Invest in your blessings now. Don't wait. And over and over we're told to invest in our blessings. And this is a lesson that Jesus taught us in his parable of the talents. I don't have time to get into it because it's long. But the point of the story, the gist of the story, is you need to invest in the blessings that God gives you to multiply those blessings. In each situation, the master gives each of, the, of his servants so many talents, so much money. It represents the blessings of God. And then the master leaves for a time, and then he's told, he tells them to multiply the blessings that he has given them. It's a parable for life. And there's a reason for this. We live in a fallen world. But our wisdom is a reflection of who God is. This is why we are called to meditate on God's goodness, because we are to be like him. And we are called to bring good into the world, just as God did. Now, ours is derivative of God's goodness. So what can we do? We, bless it, we, we invest in the blessings and the goodness that God has already given us. That's how we multiply God's goodness, to share his grace and mercy and invest in the things that God has already blessed us with. You have friendships and, and children and grandchildren and families and friends. Invest in those things. Take something that God said is good and invest in it. Make it better. Make it grow exponentially. This is how we find real and true and lasting happiness. By recognizing the fact that God created the world good, he created you to be good. And our purpose as imagers of God is to create more goodness, to bring God's kingdom to the earth. But fools don't understand what godly happiness is. We see that fools define happiness by their physical needs. Fools define happiness by their physical needs. Fools do not recognize the spiritual truth. They don't recognize God's blueprint. They don't recognize that there was a plan before creation happened. In God's silence, he created a, there was a plan. And he had a plan, and it was beautiful, and it was great. And then God created, but he had a plan in mind. It was to bless and not curse, the text says. And we read, the feast is prepared for laughter, and wine makes life happy, and money is the answer for everything. And I want you to write in your Bibles, this is the response of the fool. It's hard for us to see this in the text, but this is actually the response of the fool. This is what the fool sees the purpose of life is. The fool says, a feast is prepared for laughter. That's the only purpose of feasting, is laughter. Just like you know, having a party. The only reason to have a party is to get drunk. Wine is, the purpose of wine is just to be happy. Money answers everything. These are the lies that fools sell themselves. The problem with fools is that they do not recognize that there's a deeper purpose and meaning in life. All they can see is what's right in front of them. All they can see is the pleasure and pain of life. All they can grasp is their current feelings and emotions. They can't see eternity because they do not believe in eternity. This is why scripture says we walk by faith. It's very different. We walk by faith. So we, so we are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Now, we can't see the heaven. We can't see that there's a spiritual life behind this world, but we take it on faith that it's true even though we can't see it. So we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And we are confident and satisfied to be out of the body. We're confident, we're fine. If we die, praise God. If we're alive, praise God. We don't live by fear. Therefore, whether we are at home or away, we make our aim to be pleasing to him. Wise people walk by truth even though they can't see it. We walk by faith and not by sight. Not because we're foolish, not because we're just buying into an imaginary gray-haired man in the sky. It's not why we do this. We believe that the love of God is just as strong or stronger, we would say, than the love you experience with your spouse, with your children, with your parents, with your grandparents. Would some, if, if a person, if an atheist came up to you and said that love doesn't exist because you can't measure it, would you say that you, oh, I guess I don't love my kids? 
Would you say that grandparents, if you're looking at your grandkids and somebody said, well, you can't measure how much you love your grandkids. It's actually just an imaginary, you know, thing that you just, you know, whatever. It's not real. You would, without a doubt, say, no, I love my grandkids. I know I love my grandkids. I know I love my parents. I know I love my kids. I can't see it. I can't feel it. I can't touch love. I can't embrace love. I can't measure love. But we know it's there because we know it's true. And this is the difference between us and the fool. Fools, they don't believe in anything beyond what they can see. They live in the now. They, this is their whole entire experience. They pretend that they know things, but in reality, they know nothing. They don't even know the very purpose of life because they deny eternity. And here's the thing, church. As frustrating as it is, we should not hate or fight or yell or cuss or argue with those who don't know the Lord any more than we would punish or spank or scold or belittle a toddler for not recognizing the danger of walking in the street. Fools and non-believers, not necessarily the same thing, non-believers don't know. Our purpose is to help them see it, to experience the love of God. And we do that by enforcing the goodness that God has already created. This is why fools don't invest in their current blessings, because they don't recognize the gifts from God. They want something new, the text says. They want something new and exciting because they don't know what it feels like to have something that lasts forever. They don't invest in their marriages because cheating is more exciting. It's new. They don't invest in their current house because who cares? And then they lose their roof when a storm comes. They satisfy their urges here and now because they can't see the blessings and the curses that come in the long run. They don't invest in the goodness because they don't recognize the goodness when they're blessed with it. And so now we've come full circle to point number five. Interestingly, I, I taught uh, a hunter safety yesterday. I, I'm a volunteer, so I, I'm a trainer for hunter safety. And I, taught, I teach ethics and uh, survival training and I came across, this is in my PowerPoint slideshow for hunter safety, and I was like, this is perfect. This guy is Aldo Leopold. He was born in Burlington, Iowa, and then he was a professor at UW-Madison, where my alma mater. And he said this, ethical behavior is doing the right thing when no one else is watching, even when doing the wrong thing is legal. Which is point number five. Wisdom and foolishness are revealed in our private moments. Your real character, who you really are, is revealed when you are alone. That's just how it is. You are the most real when you are by yourself. The text tells us, Do not curse the king even in your thoughts. Listen to that. The wise person doesn't even curse the king or authority in their thoughts. But then it says, do not curse a rich person in your bedroom. For the bird of the sky may carry the message, and a winged creature may report the matter. He's using this very symbolic and lofty language, but he's trying to help you understand that in your own mind, in the privacy of your bedroom, in your most intimate places where you think you are safe, foolishness can infect your life. The teacher talks about kings and princes and leaders, but at the end of the day, the majority of us will never be that. Majority of us will never be president or a senator or governor or whatever. But all that means is that those of us who live this life right now, we have to be content with what we do have and where we are. And who you are is revealed when you're alone. He shows this symbolically through this idea of the most safe place that most of us can imagine, our bedroom. In our bedrooms, we undress. In our bedrooms, we are literally naked. Think about this. In our bedrooms is where you make love to your spouse. You have those most intimate conversations that you ever have in your bedroom. 
Yet our bedrooms are not exempt from foolishness and wisdom. We need to submit our whole lives, including our intimate moments, to God's grace and will. Even our time with our spouse in our bedroom when you're alone, you need to submit that time to God as well because who you truly are is revealed really in those moments when you think no one is watching. Here's one of the questions. When I do marital counseling, one of the questions I ask, if a person, if a couple is struggling and they come to me for marital counseling, the first thing I ask them is, are you praying alone with your spouse? Nine times out of ten, I can tell you right now that a couple who is struggling in their marriage, they are not praying with their spouse. And this is something that I just assume should be happening. We are Christians. We should be praying with, by ourselves, let alone with the person who's supposed to be. We're supposed to be one flesh with our spouse. And how many of us, we don't even take the time to pray with our spouse? I was talking to one gentleman, a different state, so he doesn't know. <clears throat> but one gentleman was, was having issues with his spouse. And I asked him this question, well, how often do you pray with your wife? Well, I never pray with my wife. I mean, you don't pray with your wife. How are you supposed to lead your family if you don't pray with your wife? Well, we just, I just don't pray with her. I pray on my own. That's selfishness. It's absurd. It is completely and utterly ridiculous for a man, especially, to not at least initiate a prayer with his wife. We need to be praying with our spouse, praying with our children in real time for real issues, not just the, okay, let's go to bed and pray. Why? Because we, are, we need to know that we need to submit our marriages and our lives and our private moments to God's grace, love, and his correction. I think that more often than not, the reason why we don't pray with our spouses is because we don't want to admit that we're wrong. We don't want to admit that we might have made a mistake. We don't want God's Holy Spirit to convict our hearts, to force us to recognize our shortcomings, because it hurts. This is why Paul says this. He says, don't work only while being watched in order to please people. But as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. Paul's point is, don't do stuff just because somebody might see you doing it. God is watching all the time in your heart, in your thoughts, in the silence of your life. He's talking about that silent moment. He wants that to manifest itself in real time, and God is watching. God knows. Don't do things so people can see it, because God can see it all the time. His point was that. The Holy Spirit knows. The Holy Spirit can see you in your private moments. And here's the thing. This is the scary part. This is not just the difference between a wise person and a foolish person. <clears throat> this is the difference between a follower of Jesus Christ and a person who has lied to themselves and convinced themselves they know the Lord. If your silence, if your personal life when you are alone has not changed with your decision to follow Jesus, you are not saved. And if you think that's harsh words, blame Jesus. Jesus says exactly that. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who calls him Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On, the day, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name and do that in your name? How many Christians are going to die and be in front of their Savior and say, I went to church every Sunday. I gave money. I did this. I did that. I blessed my neighbor. I did this. I did all these different things. I did miracles. He said, Jesus says, I will announce to them, I will tell them to their face, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreaker. Your silent moments when you are alone are essential to your faith because they reveal your true heart. We are here to, we're not here to fight or argue. We are here to serve our Lord and Savior with our whole lives, to reveal more and more every day of who we are, to expose our money and our career and our marriage and our children, to give everything over to the grace of God and submit it to Him and live the life that He has called us to live in every 
avenue of our lives. In your most intimate moments is where it starts. In your silent moments is where it starts. In your heart. And Jesus says, this is the measure of wisdom itself. Jesus continues and says, therefore. This is how you can deal with it. He says, therefore. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, doesn't just hear them, but acts on them, will be like a sensible person, a wise person who built their house on the rock. The person who builds their house on the rock, the rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded the house, but it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine, this warning, if you hear this warning of mine and you don't act, they are like the foolish man who built his house on sand. Rain fell, rivers rose, winds blew, pounded the house, and it collapsed. And its collapse was great. Don't think that your quiet moments and your silence and when you're alone, is as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, we've heard that, right? Well, I'm not hurting anybody. While well, you look at porn, I'm not hurting anybody. You cheat on your taxes, cheat on your spouse, be lazy at work. I'm not hurting anybody. The thing is that then you're a cheater. You're an adulterer. You are not a, you're not acting the life of a person who's saved. Your life should be different. If you don't do the things and want to do the things that God has called us to do, you're not saved. If you don't feel conviction when you do something wrong, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And those things, those intimate moments, those quiet moments that you think that no one can see, God sees. And that, those quiet moments where no one sees are going to have reverberating effects on your life. And Jesus says, you think that that quiet moment, no one's going to know? They're going to watch your life completely collapse. And it all started when you were silent, when you were alone. We're searching for something real. That's what the whole purpose of this study is. And the rock, Jesus Christ, is as real as it gets. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy, Lord. You are so good. We pray as your church, the River Community Church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we pray that you would forgive us our sins. Help us to forgive others as you've forgiven us. We trust that you do forgive. And Lord, we pray for your conviction that you would help us to slowly but surely turn over every aspect of our lives to you. Lord, please help us to submit our minds to you. Help us submit our thoughts to you. Help us submit our marriages and our children and our grandchildren and our bank accounts and our jobs and our bodies and our hearts. Help us to submit every aspect of who we are to your will and help us, Lord, to create good out of the chaos of sin. And what a blessing it is to be able to be your hands and feet and to slowly but surely bring more good into this world. To imitate your creation story as we create good and bless others. Help us to experience your love. Help us to feel your love and help us to spread that experience and that love to others. We thank you, Lord, and praise you for the privilege of serving you by serving those who still need to know you. In Jesus' name, amen.